लेक्चर टू पाथ साइकिल्स ट्रेल्स एंड वॉक्स रिकैप ऑफ प्रीवियस लेक्चर इन प्रीवियस लेक्चर वी हैव डिस्कस्ड ब्रीफ इंट्रोडक्शन टू द फंडामेंटल्स ऑफ ग्राफ थ्योरी एंड हाउ द ग्राफ्स कैन बी यूज टू मॉडल द रियल वर्ल्ड प्रॉब्लम्स सो इन द प्रीवियस लेक्चर वी हैव सीन वॉट इज अ ग्राफ कंटेंट ऑफ दिस लेक्चर इन दिस लेक्चर वी विल डिस्कस द पीटरसन ग्राफ द कनेक्शंस इन द ग्राफ बाई पार्टाइड ग्राफ there are three things which primarily which we are going to cover in this particular lecture and how these three things are going to be used that is the walk trail path and a cycle peterson graph peterson graph is a simple graph whose vertices are two element subsets of five element set and whose edges are the pairs of disjoint two element subsets why we are discussing peterson graph because peterson graph is a important graph and going to be used as a graph to ex to illustrate various principles of the graph theory so here we are have to see here two things one is the five element set let us assume 1 2 3 4 5 five. five element set as 1 2 3 4 five now we have to find out we have to form the two element subsets out of them so two element subsets which we can form out of this five element set would be 1 2 2 3 3 4 4 5 5 1 and so on so here this two element set two element subset will become the vertices here in the peterson graph and the edge means the edges are basically those pairs of disjoint two element subsets for example 1 2 and 3 4 they are disjoint two element subset so they will basically put an edge here in this particular uh, graph so let us see the structure of the peterson graph so here in the peterson graph we can see that all the subsets of two element two element sets will basically form the vertices of this peterson graph so you just see that all these are basically the vertices of a peterson graph and the edge will form between these two disjoint uh two element subsets so 4 5 and 1 2 they are disjoint subsets two element subsets so basically they will form an edge so this particular way we can construct a peterson graph there are three ways peterson graph can be drawn so there are three drawings possible of a peterson graph which is shown over here there is a theorem that if two vertices are non adjacent in the peterson graph then they have exactly one common neighbor for example xy and xz they are basically the vertices so there is a common element that is called x so basically there is one node which is basically the joining these two elements so there will be only at most one element so this you can illustrate or you can understand that so both of x will basically consume one element out of five elements and x and y will consume furthermore two elements so together these two nodes will form three elements so out of five element subsets two element will remain and two element will basically constitute only one common neighbor so hence the theorem is stated now girth of a graph so girth is basically the length of the shortest cycle in a graph so if the graph does not contain any cycle then the girth of that graph is infinite now there is a theorem which states that the peterson graph has the girth 5 let us see the proof and it will also explain the girth of a particular graph now girth of a graph is basically the length of the smallest or a length of the shortest cycle so let us start from the shortest cycle that is basically the cycle of length 1 and we have to see whether this is present in the peterson graph or not since peterson graph is a simple graph it has no loops so basically it will not have any cycle of length 1 now we consider a cycle of length 2 now cycle of length 2 will be basically the 
the two edges which have the same endpoints. So since this is basically a simple graph, so such multiple or multi edges will not be possible here in the Peterson graph, hence there are no two cycles. Now we consider the next possibility is basically the three cycle. Now here in the five elements, in the previous theorem we have seen that no three pair disjoint two sets will have uh, two different nodes joining uh, these three disjoint sets. So basically there will not be uh, a three cycle possible here in this five element set. Similarly in the previous proof we have seen two with the previous theorem we have seen the two non adjacent vertices has exactly one common neighbor. So there will not be any four cycle. So there will not be any possibility of a three cycle, there will not be any possibility of a four cycle. So there is a possibility of a five cycle, five, there are two five cycles exist in the Peterson graph that can be illustrated 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3 and 4, 5 is one five cycle. So hence the girth of this particular graph is 5. Let us understand the three cycle once again. This particular Peterson graph has no three cycle. So three cycle means a triangle, three cycle is possible if let us say it has one two then the edge can be possible whenever there is a disjoint let us say three four and five and one more element is required to make this particular complete. So already all the already one two three four, four elements are already used or five elements are already used. So there is no way this particular cycle can be formed hence there is no three cycle possible. Now about four cycle, four cycle is one two then three four now five and one more element is required and here also two more elements are required. So in the previous theorem we have seen that we have seen that for two different disjoint uh, so two disjoint elements there is only one common element 1 2 and 2 3 there is one common element possible. Now if there are two non disjoint vertices is possible exactly for exactly we will have only one common neighbor. So we require two common neighbors to complete the four cycle which is not possible. So this completes the proof that Peterson graph has the girth of 5. Now let us start our most important part of this particular lecture which will give you the definitions of walk, trails, then path and a cycle and we are going to see that these particular four different properties or terms in the graph theory how they are going to play a major role in characterizing a special kind of graph that is called a bipartite graph or characterizing a cycle in a graph and so on or characterizing the cut edge. So all these things we are going to see. So not only these definitions how these particular terms are going to be useful in building up the further graph theory. So let us begin with the walk. So walk is a list of vertices and edges which are listed as V0 e1, v1 and so on ek, vk for a particular edge ei will have the end points as vi minus 1 and vi. So in the sense for a particular edge ei it will have the vertices vi minus 1 and vi. So we can form a list of vertices and edges v0, v, v0, e1, v1, e2 and so on up to ek and vk. So this is called basically a walk. Now if we see here these particular edges which are appearing in the walk can be repeated more than once and also the vertices which are appearing here in this particular list that is in the walk that also can be repeated and there is no restriction in the walk. Now trail, so trail is a walk when there is no repetition of the edges allowed although the repetition of vertices are allowed then it is called a trail. As far as the path is concerned 
path is a walk which does not have the repetition of vertices or does not have the repetition of edges. So, edges and vertices if they are not repeated then that walk is called a path or otherwise you can also state that a UV path is nothing but a it is a UV trail with no repeated vertices and in the trail we have already seen that the edges are not repeated. So, that is why I have told you that path is basically a walk without heavy any repetition of vertices and the repetition of edges. So, there is no repetition of vertices and no repetition of edges in UV walk. Now, the length of a walk or a trail path cycle is its number of edges involved in all these components. So, we have to count how many edges are there and that will become the length of a walk, trail, path or a cycle. Now, a walk or a trail is closed if its end points are the same. Now, let us consider a lemma, every UV walk contains a UV path. So, the proof goes on the induction of the length of UV walk W. Let us see the base step of the induction when the length is equal to 0 of a walk W. Now, having no edge W consists of a single vertex. So, hence the length will be equal to 0 and when the length will be equal to 0. So, UV path also will have the length 0 and we have seen that for the base case when the length of a walk is 0 the path also basically is defined which will contain a path of a length 0. Now, we have to see the induction hypothesis when length is at least 1. So, length is greater than or equal to 1 in that case. Uh, suppose that the claim holds for a walk of length less than L. Now, if W has no repeated vertices, then its vertices and edges form a UV path. Now, if W has a repeated vertex W and that vertex let us say a W which is shown as the bold, then deleting the edges and the vertices between the two appearances of W will yield a shorter UV walk W prime which is contained in W. So, by induction hypothesis we know that W prime which is a shorter length path than L will contain a UV path and this particular path is contained in a larger walk that is W and hence it is proved. Connected and disconnected graphs definition a graph G is connected if it has UV path whenever UV is an pair of vertices of a graph otherwise that particular graph is disconnected. So, if G has a UV path then U is connected to V in the graph G. This particular connectedness will induce a relation on the vertex set V G and will basically induce the relation and divide into an equivalence classes that we are going to discuss here in this discussion. So, again before we go ahead let us define again a graph is called a connected graph if it has a UV path between any two pair of vertices. So, if any pair of vertices is not having a, a path or there is no connection between any pair of vertices then the graph becomes disconnected. Now, for a particular pair of vertices u v if there is a path exist in a graph then u is connected to v in the graph. So, this particular connectedness will induce a relation that is called a connection relation on a set of vertices and this comprises of this connection relation on vertices consists of the ordered pair u v such that u is connected to v and this will induce a relation or equivalence classes that we will discuss. This connected 
word is an adjective which is applied to the graphs and also to the pair of vertices. We never say that V is disconnected. So, that means that if it is a graph, then it is called a connected graph. If it is a pair, then we have to see. So, there is a distinction between the connection and adjacency. Now, if a graph G has a UV path, then U and V they are connected that we have already discussed and seen. Similarly, if U and V is an edge in a graph, then we say that U and V are adjacent or we can also say that U is joined to V or U is adjacent to V in any way. So, that is the difference between adjacency and the connection. So, connection means a connected through a path that is called UV path. Now, we have to see the connection relation. So, by lemma 1.2.5, we have proved that the graph is connected showing from each vertex there is a walk to, to one particular vertex. So, that means if there is a walk between a pair of vertices, then there must exist a path between a pair of vertices. So, whether there exists a walk or a path that will basically induce a relation that is called a connect, connection relation. So, by lemma 1.255, same lemma the connected relation is we can see that it is a transitive. That is if the graph has UV path and also at the same time it has a VW path, then that particular graph will also have a UW path that is by transitive relation. Furthermore, if we see the reflexive relation induced by the connection relation, then for a path of length 0 will be induced and that is called a reflexive. Similarly, as far as paths are reversible, that means if there is a UV path, VW path is also exist, then it is also induces another relation that is symmetric relation. So, all three relations exist and basically when a connection relation is defined, so hence the connection is an equivalence relation. Let me repeat again that the connection relation will satisfy the reflexive property. So, in the sense there is a u u path that is the path of length 0. So, that means there is no path and isolated vertex will have the path length 0. So, that will induces a reflexive property. So, that means the length of a path is the number of edges. If there is no edge, then obviously the length of a path is 0 and hence the reflexive property is satisfied. Similarly, if u v path is there, then v w path also the reverse reversible path is also possible in an undirected graph. So, symmetric relation is also defined. So, reflexive, symmetric and transitive relation based on the connection relation will induces a equivalence relation. So, a maximal connected subgraph of G is a subgraph that is connected and is not contained any other connected subgraph, then it is called a maximal connected subgraph. If the graph is not connected or if the graph does not have the connection property, then it is disconnected and we say that those maximal connected subgraph are nothing but they are called the components. So, the component of a graph G is it are its maximal connected subgraphs. A component is a trivial if it has no edges, otherwise it is non-trivial. So, an isolated vertex is a vertex of a degree 0 and that will basically induce or that will give a trivial component if it is present in the graph. Again, we will repeat that equivalence classes of the connection relation on a set of vertices V g of a graph are the vertex sets of the components of g. So, the equivalence relation, equivalence classes of the connection relation will induces the components of the vertex set that we have to see. So, component is nothing but the maximal connected subgraphs. So, take this particular graph which has these set of vertices. Now, if the connection relation is basically introduced, then what it will give? It will give a equivalence classes of the connection relations are nothing but 
the components so here the different components 1 2 3 and 4 four different components will become the equivalence classes and which is equivalence classes of the connection relation now adding and removing an edge so these components are pairwise disjoint you can see there is no edge which is connecting the component 1 and 2 similarly other components so they are pairwise disjoint there is no edge within it now if you place an edge this particular 3 and 4 2 and 3 they will join as one component instead of 2 they will become one component so adding an edge will basically reduce the number of components so the components are pairwise disjoint no two share a particular no two components share a vertex now adding an edge with the end points in the distinct components combines them into one component i have shown you in the previous figure thus adding an edge will decrease the number of components by at most one that means either if the edge is placed in the same within the same component then it is not going to decrease the number of component but if the edge is placed across the two components then the number of components will be reduced by one so at most one so adding an edge will reduce the number of components by at most one now if you delete the edge what will happen so if you delete the edge the number of components will increase by one or if it is within the same or if it is not a cut edge sometimes it is not going to increase the number of components so by deleting an edge the number of components will increase by there is a theorem which states that every graph with n vertices and k edges has at least n minus k components so the proof let us see the proof of this particular theorem an n vertex graph with no edges has n components so that is quite obvious why because let us see that there are n vertices and if you if if there is no edge which are connecting them then how many components will be there then n components will be there in that particular graph g now when an edge is added the number of components will be reduced by at most one so when the number of when and if k edges are basically added then the number of component is at least n minus k that is quite obvious so again i am repeating when an edge is added the number of component is reduced by n minus one is at most is reduced by at most one so the number of component will be at least n minus one similarly if k edges are added if k different edges are added then the number of component will be reduced by at most k and hence the number of components will be at least n minus k and hence this proves this particular theorem we can see the illustration here in this particular example here we have n is equal to 2 and number of edges is equal to 1 so how many component n minus k will be the total number of components that is 2 minus 1 one component will be there here we have n is equal to 3 and k is equal to 2 so 3 minus 2 will become one component this is n is equal to 6 and k is equal to 3 so how many component will be there three components will be there one component two component and three component n minus k 
So here the formula which we are going to use n minus k. Similarly here uh, it is 6 and it is 3. So 1, 2, 3 edges are there. So let us see how many components will be there. 1 component, 2 component, 3 component and 4 different components are there. So it says that there is at least n minus k components is there. So here that becomes equal. So here it becomes at least means more than 3 that is number of components are 4 here in this particular case. We have seen that the previous theorem basically is based on if an edge is added in an isolated vertices it will reduces the number of component by at most 1. So that particular edge is going to reduce the number of components by 1. And if that particular edge is removed from the graph, the number of component will increase by at most 1. So those kind of edges are called cut edges and if you remove the vertices, the number of components is going to increase then that vertex is also called a cut vertex. We have to see the two definitions. So cut vertex and cut edge. So a cut edge or a cut vertex of a graph is an edge or a vertex whose deletion increases the number of components. So if there is a cut edge then the number of components will be increased by 1 if they are if it is removed. If it is cut edge cut vertex and cut vertex if it is removed the number of components will be increased by many more, maybe more than 1. So take this example that if you remove this particular cut edge. So how many components this component will be this graph will have now that is the graph minus this particular cut edge will have two components. Similarly if you remove this particular vertex so how many components will basically come out this is one component two component and this will be a three components. So whenever a cut vertex is removed from a graph the number of component will be increased by many that we have seen here and this is represented in a in this particular form of notation that when a when a edge is removed from a graph it is represented as g minus e so when this edge is removed so this particular graph will become g minus c and similarly when a vertex is removed then it will be g minus v Similarly, if there is a set of edges then it is called as M and when a set of vertices then it is called as capital S. So these are the notations. Now we are going to introduce you the definition of the induced subgraph. An induced subgraph is a subgraph obtained by deleting the set of vertices. So when we write down g within square within the square braces t that is the induced subgraph of t or the subgraph of g which is induced by the set of vertices that is called capital T or you can also represent as this particular induced subgraph g t is nothing but g minus t prime. So where t prime is v g minus t. So that means this t prime if it is removed from the graph will, will remain only the t set of vertices in the graph and the resultant graph having these set of vertices and all the connections all the edges as per the original graph g then it is called basically the induced subgraph. So g t is the subgraph of g which is induced by the set of vertices. So let us take this particular graph g and the set of vertices t as a b c a b then c and d so so v minus t will become t prime so v minus t is basically e so e if you remove not only that vertex but all its edges the resulting graph which you will obtain is a induced subgraph or a induced subgraph of t so that is what is represented over here there are some more examples to it. So there is a difference between the subgraph and the induced subgraph and this is illustrated here in this particular diagram. So here you can see that this all complete thing is preserved. So G2 is nothing but 
a induced subgraph of t and t is equal to a b c d and g3 is the induced by b c so this is nothing but the subgraph which is induced by let us say t prime and t prime is nothing but b c so this particular induced subgraph is basically an independent set why because in the original graph there is no edge which is joining these two different vertices as far as g4 is concerned g4 is now taking a b c d so a b c d induced subgraph will should contain this particular edge which is present between a and d but it is not present so it is not a induced induced subgraph but it is a subgraph of g so this is the difference we have seen that what is the difference between a induced subgraph and a subgraph now there is a theorem which will use all these different concepts so the theorem says that an edge e is a cut edge if and only if e belongs to no cycle so this particular proof we have to see in both sides why because this particular theorem will give a characterization of a cut edge by characterization in the sense that if an edge is present on a cycle then it is not a cut edge so that means if it is a cut edge that is equivalent to saying that it is not present on any cycle it is not on any cycle that edge is not on the cycle so there goes a important theorem and we have to see the proof of it so the proof we have to prove in both the directions that is the necessity condition first we have to see that that e is a cut edge if e is not on the cycle so contrapositive statement we have to form and that particular statement contrapositive which says that e is on the cycle if e is not the cut edge e is not on the cut edge if we can prove this then this particular necessity condition is proved so if let us say that e is on the cycle let us say e is on the cycle so let us see this particular cycle c and e is present on this particular cycle so if e is there so the end vertices of e is basically uv so end vertices of that edge is uv now if we remove this particular e out of a graph so the graph which will be g minus e will have will have a component will be one component where u and v will be there in the same component since u and v are in the same component after removal of e therefore it is not going to disconnect the graph hence that particular e is not a cut edge why because e is a cut edge then after removal of a edge the graph will be disconnected into more than one components so here after removal of edge there will be only one component it is not disconnected component it will be a connected component where u and v will be in the same component hence therefore we have proved the necessity condition that e is not a cut edge so necessity is quite straightforward now we have to see the other side of a proof other side of a proof says that that is a sufficiency condition that edge e is a cut edge only if e belong to no cycle so contrapositive says that so e is not a cut edge and which will imply that e is on the cycle 
So, let us assume that particular edge E which is nothing but U V pair is not a cut edge. Let us assume let us let that E is U V is not a cut edge. So, if it is not a cut edge then if we remove it from the graph then there must be a U V path from U to V there is a path which is shown over here. This particular path we can represent as path which is going from u to v by more than involving more than one vertices because it is a path. So, in the graph g e followed by this particular path e followed by this particular path will basically e followed by path means from u if we take this particular edge we can reach v and from v we can take this particular path and you we can reach u again. So, this particular way we can complete a cycle if that particular edge followed by a path if we form it will it will produce a cycle. and this particular cycle will contain E within it and so E will be on the cycle. Hence, we have proved the contra positive and this contra positive will prove the other side of a proof that is the sufficiency condition. We have seen that the characterization of cut edge that edge is not on the cycle then it is a cut edge and the characterization we have proved also in the previous theorem. So, bipartite graph to characterize bipartite graphs using cycle is also very important theorem that we will see later on. So, we will also characterize similarly the bipartite graph that means, we have to come out with uh, the similar statements or a properties and then we will characterize the bipartite graph according to that particular property. To characterize a class of a graph by that particular condition, we have seen earlier in the theorem that, that the cut edge was basically characterized by the condition which basically stated that there does not exist edge on a cycle, then that edge is a cut edge. So, that condition will characterize that kind of edge of a graph. Similarly, the bipartite graph also we can characterize with a condition and that condition will involve the cycles. So, let us see that whenever we do like this and prove using theorem that becomes an equivalent equivalence statements and that will be useful in various applications in the graph theory. So, this particular condition P, so that means if we want to prove an uh, equivalence condition. So, that means we have to state like this G is a class of a graph if and only if G satisfies a condition P. So, that means if let us say a particular graph is a class of bipartite graph then basically it has to satisfy that it should not have an odd cycle P is a odd cycle that we have to see and prove that. So, in other words this condition P is both necessary and sufficient condition for the membership of for the membership of a graph in G that we have to establish. So, there are two conditions simultaneously we have to establish for proving the equivalence. So, the first condition is called necessity condition. So, necessity condition means only if part of this particular equivalence statement we have to prove this means that this G is a member of a particular kind of graph this will this has to be proved that means it will mean that or it will imply that G satisfies the condition P. For sufficiency condition we have to see the other side of a proof that the membership of a G is possible if G satisfies this particular condition. So, that means we have to start with that given condition that G satisfies P and we have to 
basically conclude that or it will imply that the membership so both the conditions we have seen so far in the previous theorem in the next theorem also we will see that so let us recall that a loop is a, is a cycle of length 1 also two distinct edges with the same this is the loop is a cycle of length 1 and two distinct edges two distinct edges edges 1 and edge 2 with the same endpoints will form a cycle of length this is c2 and this is c1 now the walk is odd or even as its length is odd or even so from the lemma 1.2.5 a closed walk contains a cycle if the vertices and edges of that cycle c occurs as a sublist of that walk w in the cyclic order but not necessarily consecutive so we can think of a closed walk or a cycle as the starting at any vertex and the next lemma will require this kind of viewpoint now we have to see a lemma so which states that every closed odd walk contains an odd cycle so let us see the induction on the length l of a closed odd walk w now if length is equal to 1 so the closed walk of length 1 traverses a cycle of length 1 so this particular length 1 the base case is so we need to prove the claim holds that if it holds for a closed walks of a shorter length w now suppose that the claim holds for a closed odd walk shorter than w if w has no repeated vertices other than the first and last then w itself forms a cycle of odd length otherwise w has the repeated vertices so we need to prove that if it is repeated then w will include a shorter closed odd walk by induction the theorem will hold let us see this particular case now if w has a repeated repeated vertex v then we can view this particular w that is the walk as the starting as v and will have two different walks this is one vv walk and this is the other vv walk since this w has an odd length so one of these walks is an odd let us say this is an odd walk and the and the other one is the even the odd one is shorter than the w by induction hypothesis it means that this it contains an odd cycle and this cycle appears in the order in w so that is why this odd plus even becomes an odd so every odd walk contains an odd cycle we are going to see the characterization of a bipartite graph using cycles or using odd cycles so the theorem which is given by koenig is stated as a graph is bipartite if and only if it has no odd cycle so let us first see the illustrative examples that this is a bipartite graph it has a cycle that is a even cycle and it can be represented in a form of a bipartite graph here also another example here there is a cycle but this cycle is an even cycle hence there is no odd cycle present in the graph and this is equivalent to saying that this is a bipartite graph and which is expressed in the form of a bipartition this is one partite set this is another partite set here also so this way of representing is called a bipartition so if you want to prove 
that a graph is not a bipartite graph then you have to present an odd cycle odd cycle means the graph is not a bipartite graph to prove that the graph is a bipartite graph you have to come out with a bipartition in this particular manner so this basically will categorize the bipartite which is equivalent to saying that the graph has no odd cycle and this particular theorem which states that the graph is bipartite if and only if it has no odd cycle is given by Koenig famous mathematician so this is the sufficiency condition let us prove the sufficiency condition first the graph is bipartite if it has no odd cycle and we assume a graph with no odd cycle so here we assume the graph with no odd cycle and we have to prove that this particular graph which is not having any odd cycle is a bipartite graph this is sufficiency condition so here we prove that the graph g is bipartite how we can prove the g as a bipartite so we have to come out with a bipartition the construction of a bipartition so we prove g is bipartite by constructing a bipartition of each non trivial component h so for each vertex v so for each non trivial component h is assumed because if a graph is disconnected then it will be having the different components and we are considering one such maximal sub connected graph subgraph that is called the non trivial component let us say that that non trivial component is h if the graph is connected the entire graph will become h now let us say that for a particular vertex v which is there in the the graph let us say h then we have to define a function f for a particular vertex v the function is defined to be that minimum length of uv path now since h is a connected a graph or a component so fv is defined for each vertex v which is the element of vh so this way using that particular function we are going to get two different sets one set is called x consist of all the vertices let us say u such that f u is even so f u means that from v to u the v u path basically is measured in this particular function as the even so all such u's are included in x similarly from from v to let us say again w so we can consider all the vertices w which are there in h such that from v to w if there is a path so v w path and if we take this particular function will give an odd length so this particular length will become odd so based on this even an odd parity even an odd parity with the with applying this particular function f which will be of the minimum length uv path it will give the two partite sets x and y now we have to prove that this particular x and y they are the partite sets that means no two vertices which are there in x they are connected by an edge similarly no two vertices in y is connected by an edge we have to prove to complete this sufficiency condition so let us consider that there is an edge 
v and v prime whether it is within x or in y and if this particular edge is there it will create an closed odd walk using the shortest uv path and then walking through the edge v v prime within x or y and then taking a reverse of that particular shortest path so this will form a closed odd walk will have three components uv shortest path then an edge v v prime whether it is an x or y and then a reverse shortest path v v prime path now if this edge v and v prime is there then it will form a odd cycle this particular walk will contain an odd cycle by previous lemma hence it will contradict the hypothesis where we assume it has no odd cycle hence x and y they are the independent sets and the union of these particular partite sets is nothing but the complete vertex set of that particular graph hence the x y is the bipartition of that particular graph hence it's a bipartite graph now we have to see the necessity condition the necessity condition says that the graph is bipartite only if it has no odd cycle so to prove this necessity condition we have to assume that the graph is a bipartite graph that is the other side of the proof so let us assume that the graph is a bipartite graph and then we have to prove we have to conclude that it has no odd cycle so let g be a bipartite graph now every walk will alternate between two partite sets of a bipartition so every return every return to the origin partite set happens after an even number of steps this is one this is two so even number of steps so if you go back again come back after four, taking four steps so if you start from x visit y and then come back again it will take even number of steps hence whenever you want to include a cycle you have to traverse and come back to the same point and that can be that cannot be that can be done only in the even number of steps hence the g contains no odd cycle so in the nutshell what we have seen here is the properties of the connection paths cycles and how these statements are going to be useful in a graph theory so in the next lecture we will discuss the euler circuit and other fundamental properties of a graph such as the degrees of a vertices counts and extremal properties thank you